Dream of a Mannequin by Thomas Ligotti Once upon a Wednesday afternoon, a girl stepped into my office for her first session. Her name was Amy Loker. And didn't you once tell me that long ago you had a doll with this same given name? Under the present circumstances, I don't think it too gross a violation of professional ethics to use the subject's real name in describing our case to you. Certainly there's something more than simple ethics between us, ma chère ami. Besides, I understood from Miss Loker that you recommended me to her. This didn't seem necessarily ominous at first. Perhaps, I speculated, your relationship with the girl was such that made it awkward for you to take her on as one of your own patients. Actually, it's still not clear to me, my love, just how deeply you can be implicated in the overall experience I had with the petite Miss L. So you'll have to forgive any stupidities of mine which may crudely crop up in the body of this correspondence. My first impression of Miss Loker, as she positioned herself almost side-saddle in a leather chair before me, was that of a tense but basically self-possessed young woman. She was outfitted, I noticed, in much the classic style you normally favor. I won't go into our first visit preliminaries here, though we can discuss these and other matters at dinner this Saturday if only you are willing. After a brief chat, we zeroed in on what Miss Loker called the motivating factor for consulting me. This involved, as you may or may not know, a recurring dream she had been having over the period of about a month. What will follow are the events of that dream as I have composed them from my tape of Miss Loker's September 10th session. In the dream, our subject has entered into a new life at least to the extent that she holds down a different job from her waking one. Miss Loker had already informed me that for three years she has worked as a loan processor at a local financial firm. However, her working day in the dream finds her as a longtime employee of a fashionable clothing shop. Like those witnesses for the prosecution that the government wishes to protect with new identities, she has been outfitted by the dream with what seems to be a mostly tacit but somehow complete biography, a marvelous trick of the mind, this. It appears that one of the duties of her new job is to change the clothes of the mannequins in the shop's display windows. She in fact feels as if her entire existence is slavishly given over to dressing and undressing these dummies. She is profoundly dissatisfied with her lot and the mannequins become the focal point of her animus. Such is the general background presupposed by the dream, which now begins in proper. As our dummy dresser approaches her work, she is overwhelmed by an amorphous anxiety without a specific source. An awesome load of new clothes has arrived to adorn a display of mannequins. Their unclothed bodies repel her touch because, as Miss Loker explained, they are neither warm nor cold, as only artificial bodies can be. Note this rare awareness of temperature in a dream, albeit neutral. After bitterly surveying the ranks of these putty-faced creatures, she says, Time to stop dancing and get dressed, sleeping beauties. These words are spoken without spontaneity as if ritually uttered to inaugurate each dressing session. But the dream changes before the dresser is able to put one stitch on the dummies, who stare at nothing with anticipating eyes. The working day is now finished. She has returned to her small apartment, where she retires to bed and has a dream. This dream is that of the mannequin dresser and not hers, she emphatically pointed out. The mannequin dresser dreams she is in her bedroom, but what she now thinks of as her bedroom is to all appearances actually an archaically furnished hall with the dimensions of a small theater. The room is dimly lit by some jeweled lamps along the walls, the lights shining upon an intricately patterned carpet and various pieces of old furniture. She perceives the objects of the scene more as pure ideas than as material phenomena, for details are blurry and there are many shadows. There is something, however, which she visualizes quite clearly, 
one of the walls of this lofty room is missing, and beyond this great gap is a view of star-clustered blackness. The dreamer is positioned on the other side of the room from the brink of the starry abyss. Sitting on the edge of a velvety divan, she stares and waits without breath or heartbeat. All is silent, another odd perception to have in a dream. This silence somehow electrifies the dream with strange currents of force betokening an unseen demonic presence. Then a new feeling enters the dream, one slightly more tangible. There seems to be an iciness drifting in from that starscape across the room. Temperature again, a rare dream indeed. Once again our dreamer experiences a premonitory dread of something unknown. Without moving from her place on that uncomfortable couch, she visually searches the room for clues to the source of her terror. Many areas are inaccessible to her sight, like a picture that has been scribbled out in places, but she sees nothing particularly frightening and is relieved for a moment. Then her trepidation begins anew when she realizes for the first time that she hasn't looked behind her and indeed she seems physically unable to do so. Something is back there. She feels this to be a horrible truth. She almost knows what the thing is, but afflicted with some kind of oniric aphasia, she cannot find the word for what she fears. She can only wait, hoping that sudden shock will soon bring her out of the dream, for she is now aware that she is dreaming, thinking of herself in the third person. The words she is dreaming somehow form a ubiquitous motif for the present situation, as a legend written somewhere at the bottom of the dream, as echoing voices bouncing here and there around the room, as a motto printed upon fortune cookie-like strips of paper and hidden in bureau drawers and as a broken record repeating itself on an ancient Victrola inside the dreamer's head. Then all the words of this monotonous slogan gather from their diverse places and like an alighting flock of birds settle in the area behind the dreamer's back. There they twitter for a moment, as upon the frozen shoulders of a statue in a park. This is actually the way it seems to the dreamer including the statue comparison. Something statuesque is approaching her. It radiates a field of dynamic tension that grows more intense the closer it comes, its shadow lengthening upon the floor. Still, she cannot turn around to see the horror behind her, for at this point she cannot move her body, which is stiff-jointed and rigid. Perhaps she can scream, she thinks, and makes an attempt to do so. But this fails, because by then there is already a firm and tepid hand that has covered her mouth from behind. The fingers on her lips feel like thick, naked crayons. Then she sees a long, slim arm extending itself over her left shoulder, and a hand that is holding some filthy rags before her eyes and shaking them making them dance. And at that moment, a dry, sibilant voice whispers into her ear, It's time to get dressed, little darling. She tries to look away, her eyes being the only things she can move. Now, for the first time, she notices that all around the room, in the shadowed places, are people dressed as dolls. Their forms are collapsed, their mouths opened wide. They do not look as if they are still alive. Some of them have actually become dolls, their flesh no longer supple and their eyes having lost the appearance of teary moistness. Others are at various intermediate stages between humanness and dollhood. With horror, the dreamer now becomes aware that her own mouth is opened wide and will not close. But at last, Shaking with tremors of the uncanny, she is able to turn around and face the menacing agent. The dream now reaches a shattering crescendo, and she awakes. She does not, however, awaken the bed of the mannequin dresser in her dream within a dream, but instead finds herself directly transported into the tangled, 
though real, bed covers of her loan processor self. Not exactly sure where or who she is for a moment. Her first impulse on awaking is to complete the movement she began in the dream, that is, turning around to look behind her. The hypnopompic hallucination that followed made her feel as if she had temporarily lost her mind. What she saw, upon pivoting about, was more than just a blank wall. For projecting out of that moon-whitened surface was the face of a female mannequin. And what particularly disturbed her about this illusion, and here we go deeper into already dubious realms, was that the face didn't melt away into the background of the wall the way post-dream projections usually do. It seems, rather, that this protruding visage, in one smooth movement, withdrew back into the wall. Her scream summoned more than a few concerned persons from neighboring apartments. End of dream and related experiences. Now, my darling, you can probably imagine my reaction to the above psychic yarn. Every loose skein I followed led me back to you. The character of Miss Loker's dream is strongly reminiscent, in both mood and scenario, of matters you have been exploring for some years now. I'm referring, of course, to the all-around astral ambiance of Miss Loker's dream and how eerily it relates to certain notions, very well, theories, that in my opinion have become altogether too central to your oeuvre as well as to your vi. Above all, I refer to those other worlds you say you've detected through a combination of occult studies and depth analysis. At this juncture, allow me to digress for a brief lecture apropos of the proceeding. It's not that I object to your delving into speculative models of reality, sweetheart, but why this particular one? Why posit these little zones, as I've heard you call them, having such hideous attributes, or should I say anti-attributes, to keep up with your theoretical lingo? To whimsically joke about such bizarrery with phrases like pockets of interference and cosmic static belies your talents as a thoughtful member of our profession. And the rest of it, the hyper-uncanniness, the ontological games, the generally cosmic substance of these places, and all that other transcendent nonsense. I realize that psychology has charted some awfully weird areas in its maps of the mind, but you've gone so far into the ultramentational hinterlands of metaphysics that I fear you will not return, at least not with your reputation intact. To speak of your ideas with regard to Miss Loker's dream, you can see the correlations, especially in the winding plot of her narrative. But I'll tell you when these links to your fanciful hypotheses really struck me with a hammer blow. It was just after she had related her dream to me. Now riding the saddle of her chair in the normal position, she made a few remarks obviously intended to convey the full extent of her disquiet. I'm sure she thought it de rigueur to tell me that after her dream episode she began entertaining doubts concerning what she really was. Loan processor? Mannequin dresser? Other? 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 Rationally, she knew her genuine factual self. However, some new sense of unreality undermined her complete emotional assurance in this matter. Surely you can see how the foregoing existential tricks fit in with those harassments of the self as you style such phenomena. And just what are the boundaries of the self? Is there a secret communion of seemingly separate things? How do animate and inanimate relate? Very boring, my dear. Zzzz. It all reminds me of that trite little fable of the Chinese philosopher, Xuanzi, who dreamed he was a butterfly, but upon waking affected not to know whether he was a man who'd dreamed he was a butterfly, or a butterfly now dreaming. You get the idea. The question is, do things like butterflies dream? Answer, an unequivocal no, as you may be aware from the research done in this field. The issue is ended right there. 
accredited studies notwithstanding, as I'm sure you would contest, suppose the dreamer is not a man or butterfly, but both, or neither, something else altogether. Or suppose, really, we could go on and on like this, and we have. Possibly the most repellent concept you've developed is that which you call divine masochism, or the doctrine of a bigger self terrorizing its little splinter cells, precisely that something else altogether scarifying the man butterfly with suspicions that there's a game going on over its head. The trouble with all this, my beloved, is the way you're so adamant about its objective reality and how you sometimes manage to infect others with your far-fetched convictions. Me, for instance. After hearing Miss Loker tell her dream story, I found myself unconsciously analyzing it much as you might have. Her multiplication of roles, including the role reversal with a mannequin, really did put me in mind of some divine being that was splintering and scarring itself to relieve its cosmic ennui, as indeed a few of the well-reputed gods of world religion supposedly do. I also thought of your divinity of the dream, that thing which is all-powerful in its own sphere. Contemplating the realm of Miss Loker's dream, I did experience a fleeting sense of that old vagary about a solipsistic dream deity commanding all it sees, all of which is only itself. And a corollary to solipsism even occurred to me. If, in any possible universe, one always has to allow that there are other universes that may be only dreams, then the problem becomes, as with our Chinese sleepyhead, knowing when one is actually dreaming and what form the waking self may have. And this is something one can never know. The fact that the overwhelming majority of thinkers reject any doctrine of solipsism more than suggests its unreality. And, after all, the feeling of dissociation from reality takes place only in a conscious state and not in dreams, wherein everything is absolutely real. See what you've done to me. For reasons that you well know, my love, I try to give what serious consideration I can to your aberrant investigations. I can't help myself, but I don't think it right to be exerting your influence upon innocents like Miss Loker. I should tell you that I hypnotized the girl, and her unconscious testimony seems very much to incriminate you. She practically demanded the hypnosis, feeling this to be an easy way of unveiling the source of her problems. Because of her frantic insistence, I obliged her. A serendipitous discovery ensued. She was a superior subject. In hypnosis we restricted ourselves to penetrating the mysteries of her dream. Her mesmerized rendition of it was amazingly consistent with her waking version with the exception of one important item which I'll get to in a moment. I asked her to enlarge upon her feelings in the dream and any sense of meaning she experienced. Her responses to these questions were sometimes given in the incoherent language of the Oniric. She said some quite awful things about life and lies and this dream of flesh. I don't think I need to go into the details of the chilling nonsense she uttered for I've heard you say much the same in one of your states. Really, it's appalling the way you dwell both on and in your zones of the metaphysically flayed self. That little thing which Miss Loker mentioned only under hypnosis, and which I have deferred referencing in its particulars, was a very telling piece of data. It told on you, for when my patient first described the scenes of her dream drama to me, she had forgotten or just neglected to touch on, the presence of another character hidden in the background. This deep cover agent was the proprietor of the clothing store, a domineering boss who was played by a certain lady psychoanalyst. Not that you were ever on stage, even in a cameo appearance, but the hypnotized Miss Loker did remark in passing on the identity of this imperious figure in the dream of her working girl self this information being one of the many underlying suppositions of the dream. 
So you, my dear, were present in Miss Loker's hypnotic statement in more than just spirit. I found this revelation immensely helpful in coordinating the separate items of evidence against you. The nature of the said evidence, however, was such that I could not rule out the possibility of a conspiracy between you and Miss Loker, so I refrained from asking my new patient anything about her relationship with you, and I didn't inform her of what she disclosed under hypnosis. My assumption was that she was guilty until proven otherwise. Alternatives did occur to me, though, especially when I realized Miss Loker's extraordinary susceptibility to hypnosis. Isn't it just possible, sweet love, that Miss Loker's incredible dream was brought on by one of those post-hypnotic suggestions at which you're so well practiced? I know that lab experiments in this area are sometimes eerily successful, and eeriness is, without argument, your specialty. Still another possibility involves the study of dream telepathy, in which you have no small interest. So what were you doing the night Miss Loker underwent her dream ordeal? You weren't with me, I know that. And how many of those idola on my poor patient's mental screen were images projected from an outside source? These are just some of the peculiar questions which lately seem so necessary to ask. But the answers to such questions would still only establish your means in this crime. What about your motive? On this point, I need not exert my psychic resources. It seems there is nothing you won't do to impose your ideas upon common humanity, deplorably on your patients, obnoxiously on your colleagues, and affectionately, I hope, on me. I know it must be hard for a lonely visionary like yourself to remain mute and ignored, but you've chosen such an eccentric path to follow that I fear there are few spirits brave enough to accompany you into those zones of calculated deception, at least not voluntarily. Which brings us back to Miss Loker. By the close of our first and only session, I still wasn't sure whether she was a willing or unwilling emissary of yours. Hence, I kept mum about anything concerning your role in this mystery tale. Nor did she happen to speak of you in any significant way, except, of course, unconsciously in hypnosis. At any rate, as first sessions go, this one was more arduous and time-consuming than usual, which left my new patient no less tautly wired than when we began. Not unreasonably, she asked me to prescribe for her. As Dr. Bovary tried to assuage the oppressive dreams of his wife with a prescription of valerian and camphor baths, I supplied Miss Loker with a program for serenity that included Valium and companionship, the latter of which I also recommend for us, darling. Then we made a date for the following Wednesday at the same time. Miss Loker seemed most grateful, though not enough, according to my secretary, to pay up what she owed and wait till you find out where she wanted us to send the bill. The following week Miss Loker did not appear for her appointment. This did not really alarm me, for as you know many patients, armed with a script for tranquilizers and a single experience of therapy, decide they don't need any more help. But by then I had developed such a personal interest in Miss Loker's case that I was seriously disappointed at the prospect of not being able to pursue it further. After fifteen patientless minutes had elapsed, I had my secretary call Miss Loker at the number she gave us. With my former secretary, rest in peace, this would have been done automatically. So the new girl is not as good as you said she was, doctor. I shouldn't have let you insinuate her into my employ, but that's my fault, isn't it? Maggie came into my office a few minutes later, presumably after she'd tried to reach Miss Loker. With rather cryptic impudence, she suggested I dial the number myself, giving me the form containing all the information on our new patient. Then she left the room without saying another word. The nerve of that soon-to-be unemployed girl. I called the number, and it rang twice before someone answered. This someone was a young woman by the sound of her voice, though not our Miss Loker. 
and the way she answered the phone told me I had a wrong number, the right wrong number. Nevertheless, I asked if an Amy Loker was associated in any way with the place I called, but the answering voice expressed total ignorance regarding the existence of any person by that name. I thanked her and hung up. You will have to forgive me, my lovely, if by this time I began to feel like the victim of a hoax. Maggie, I intercommed, how many more appointments for this afternoon? Just one, she immediately answered, and then without being asked, said, But I can cancel it if you'd like. I said I would like, and that I intended to be out for the rest of the afternoon. My intention was to call on Miss Loker at the, probably also phony, address on her new patient form. I had the suspicion that the address would lead to the same geographical spot as had the electronic nexus of the false phone number. Of course I could have easily verified this without leaving my office, but knowing you, sweet one, I thought that a personal visit was warranted, and I was right. The address was a half hour's drive away. It was in a high-class suburb on the other side of town from that high-class suburb in which I have my office, and I wish you would move your own place of business from its present location, unless for some reason you need to be near a skid row source that broadcasts on frequencies of chaos and squalor, which you'd probably claim. I parked my big black car down the block from the street number I was seeking, which turned out to be located in the middle of the suburb's shopping district. This was last Wednesday, which, if you recall, was a meteorologically abysmal day, an accomplishment I do not list among all your orchestrated connivances of my adventure. It was dim and moody most of the morning and so prematurely dark by late afternoon that there were stars seemingly visible in the sky. A storm was imminent, and the air was appropriately galvanized with a pre-deluge feeling of suspense. Display windows were softly glowing, and a jewelry store twinkled in the threatening gloom as I passed by. Of course, there's no further need to describe the atmosphere of that day, dear love. I just wanted to show how sensitive I was to a certain kind of portentous mood I know you adore, and how ripe I'd become for the staged antics to follow. Distance-wise, I only had to walk a few steps before arriving at the place purported to be the home of our Miss L. By then it was quite clear what I would find. There were no surprises so far. When I looked up at the neon-inscribed name of the shop, I heard a young woman's telephone voice whispering the words into my ear, Mademoiselle Fashions. And this is the store, n'est-ce pas, where it seems you acquire so many of your own lovely ensembles. But I'm jumping ahead with my expectations. What I did not expect was the sheer lengths to which you would go in order to fire up my sense of strange revelation. Was this, I pray, done to bring us closer in the divine bonds of unreality? Anyway, I saw what you wanted me to see, or what I thought you wanted me to see, in the window of Mademoiselle Fashions. The thing was even dressed in the same plaid-skirted outfit that I recalled Miss Loker was wearing on her only visit to my office. And I have to admit that I was taken aback when I focused on the frozen face of the mannequin. Then again, perhaps I was subliminally looking for a resemblance between Miss Loker, your fellow conspirator, whether she knows it or not, and the figure in the window. You can probably guess what I noticed, or thought I noticed, about its eyes, what you would have me perceive as a watery gleam in their fixed gaze. Ho, oh, woe is this Wednesday's child! Unfortunately, I was unable to linger long enough to confirm positively the above perception, for a medium-intensity shower began to descend at that point. The rain sent me running to a nearby phone booth, where I had some business to conduct anyway. Retrieving the number of the clothing shop from my memory, I phoned them for the second time that afternoon. That was easy. What was not quite as easy was imitating your voice, my high-pitched love, 
and asking if the store's accounting department had mailed out a bill that month for my, I mean your, charge account. My impersonation of you must have been adequate, for the voice on the phone reminded me that I'd already taken care of all my recent expenditures. I, by whom I mean you, thanked the sales girl for this information, apologizing for our forgetfulness, and then said goodbye. Perhaps I should have asked the girl if she was the one who helped rig up that mannequin to look like Miss Loker, if indeed the situation was not the other way around, with Miss Loker following the fashion of display window dummies. In any case, I did establish a definite link between you and the clothing shop. It seemed you might have accomplices anywhere, and to tell you the truth, I was beginning to feel a bit paranoid standing in that little phone booth. The rain was coming down even harder as I made a mad dash back to my black sedan. A bit soaked, I sat in the car for a few moments, wiping off my rain-spotted glasses with a handkerchief. I said that I felt a slight case of paranoia coming on, and what follows proves it. While sitting there with my glasses off, I thought I saw something move in the rearview mirror. My visual vulnerability combined with the claustrophobic sensation of being in a car with rain-blinded windows, together added up to a momentary but very definite panic on my part. I quickly put on my glasses and found there was no one, and no thing, whatever, in the back seat. But the point is that I was forced to physically verify this fact in order to relieve my spasm of anxiety. You succeeded, my love, in getting me to experience a moment of self-terror. And in that moment, I, too, became an accomplice in the mystical conspiracy of a treacherous universe. Brava! You have indeed succeeded, assuming my inferences stand solid, in swaying me on a string you hold between your delicate fingers. Having confessed this much, I can now get to the real focus and motivating factor of my appeal to you. This has far less to do with A. Loker than it does with us, dearest. Please try to be sympathetic and, above all, patient. I have not been well lately, and you know the reason why. This business with Miss Loker, far from bringing us to a more intimate understanding of each other, has only made the situation worse. Horrible nightmares now plague me on a nightly basis. Me, of all people, and they are directly due to the well-intentioned, I think, influence of you and Miss L. Let me describe one of these nightmares for you, and thereby describe them all. This will be the last dream story, I promise. In the dream I am in my bedroom, sitting upon my unmade bed and wearing my pajamas. Oh, will you never see them? The room is partially illuminated by beams from a street light shining through the window, and it also seems to me that a galaxy of constellations, though not witnessed firsthand, are contributing their light to the scene, a vaporous glowing which unnaturally blanches the entire upstairs of the house. I have to use the bathroom and walk sleepily out to the hallway, where I get the shock of my life. In the whitened hallway, I cannot say brightened, because it is almost as if a fluorescent powder coats everything. There are things that look like people dressed as dolls, or else dolls made up to look like people. I remember being confused about which it was, and they are lying up and down the floor, at the top of the stairway, and even upon the stairs themselves as they disappear into the darker regions below. When I emerge from the bedroom, I see their eyes shining in the white darkness, and their heads are turned in all directions. Paralyzed, yes, with terror, I merely return a fixed gaze, wondering if my eyes are shining the same as theirs. Then one of the doll people, slouching against the wall on my left, turns its head haltingly upon a stiff little neck and looks straight at me. Worse, it talks, and its voice is a horrible parody of human speech. Even more horrible are its words when it says, Become as we are, sweetie. Die into us.
Suddenly I begin to feel very weak, as if my life were being drained out of me. Summoning all my willpower, I manage to rush back to my bed, which ends the dream. After I awake, screaming, my heart pounds like a mad prisoner inside me and doesn't let up until morning. This is very disturbing, for there's truth in those studies relating nightmares to cardiac arrest. For some poor souls, that imaginary incubus squatting upon their sleeping forms can do real medical harm, and I do not want to become one of these cases. You can help me, my precious. I know you didn't intend things to turn out this way, but that bit of intrigue you perpetrated with the help of Miss Loker has really gotten to me. Consciously, of course, I still uphold the criticism I've already expressed about the basic absurdity of your work. Unconsciously, however, you seem to have awakened me to a stratum of abject terror. I will at least admit that your ideas form a powerful psychic metaphor, though no more than that. Which is quite enough, isn't it? It's certainly quite enough to inspire the writing of this letter, in which I plead for your attention since I've failed to attract it in any other way. I can't go on like this. With your harrowing trickery you have possessed me down to my deepest self. Please release me from this spell, and let's begin a normal romance. However unknown may be their psychic mechanisms, it's only emotions that matter, not zones of the unreal, not a metaphysic stripped of all that is human. In Miss Loker, I believe you sent me an embodiment of your deepest convictions. But suppose I start admitting uncanny things about her. Suppose I grant that she was somehow just a dream. Suppose I allow that she was not a girl but actually a thing without a self, an unreality that, in accord with your vision of existence, dreamed it was a human being and not just a fabricated impersonation of our flesh. You would have me entertain such thoughts. You would have me think there is some mysterious affinity among the things of this world and of other worlds. So what if there is? I don't care anymore. Forget other selves. Forget the third, fourth, nth person view of life in which some god or demon has individuated itself into bits and pieces of all that is. Only first and second persons matter, I and thou. And by all means forget dreams. I, for one, know I'm not a dream. I am real, Dr. Dash Dash. There, how do you like being an anonymity without foundation in this or any other universe? So please be so kind as to acknowledge the reality of my existence. It is now after midnight, and I dread going to sleep and having another of those nightmares. You can save me from this fate, if only you can find it in your heart to do so. But you must hurry. Time is running out for us, just as these last few waking moments are now running out for me. Tell me it is still not too late for our love. Please don't destroy everything for us. You will only hurt yourself. And despite your high-flown theory of masochism, there is really nothing divine about it. So no more playing of the inhuman visionary. Be simple. Be nice. Oh. I am so tired. I must say good night then, but not goodbye, my foolish love. Hear me now. Sleep your singular sleep and dream of the many, the others. They are also part of you, part of us. Die into them and leave me in peace. I will come for you later, and then you can always be with me in a special corner of your own just as my little Amy once was. This is what you've always wanted, and this you shall have. Die into them, you simple soul, you silly darling. Die with a nice bright gleam in your eyes.